Aisha radiallahu anha used to praise and our praise coming from a co-wife is very very valuable she actually said that innaha kanat atqana lillah wa awsalana lirrahim which means that she was one of the most god-fearing among us one of the most god-conscious among us and she was also one of those who were most particular about tying the knots of kinship like keeping uh, you know with the relatives it's a very, very important thing. As I said, we just spoke about that in the beginning that that's being lost today. Right? There's people who have not met their aunties for years or their uncles for a long time. SubhanAllah. It's really strange. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. Qala Allah ta'ala fil Qur'an al-Majid wal Furqan al-Hamid wa amra'atun mu'minatun in wahabat nafsaha lin nabiyy in arad al-nabiyyu an yastankihaha khalisatan laka min dun al-mu'minin. Sadaqallahul Azim. So, dear sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're going to cover today one of the blessed wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to learn a bit more about her. And there's a reason to learn about the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the wisdoms of how having multiple wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was that they were then able to relate the various different internal happenings of the Prophet's life and his home and his household to the Ummah so that they could benefit from it. Because the Prophet as a man, he would discuss a number of things to the men and of course he would discuss things for women as well, but what you would get from a woman would be different and the best representatives of that are the Prophet's Zawjat, which is uh, very, very important for us to understand their lives as well. They were specially chosen, and that is why it's important for us to learn about them as well. So today we're going to speak about Maymuna radiallahu anha. Maymuna radiallahu anha is the last uh, of the wives that the Prophet married. So she's the last of the Ummahatul Mu'mineen in that sense. Her name wasn't originally Maymuna, that's the name the Prophet ﷺ gave her. Her name was Barra. And Barra means the obedient one or the... It's like a self-righteousness, a name that uh, usually denotes self-righteousness. Same thing they say was about Juwayriya radiallahu anha, that her name was Barra. So the Prophet ﷺ changed that uh, to say, don't uh, consider yourself to be... Don't purify yourself. So uh, Maymuna is a good name. Maymuna is a good name. It refers to good fortune and so on. So she's from. She's originally from from her father's side. She's from the Quraysh tribe as well. Uh, her father's name is Harith. So called Maymuna bint al Harith, ibn Hazan, and then and then it goes on. Her mother is from the Himyar tribe. And so she's from both the Quraysh tribe and the Himyar tribe. And her mother is her, her mother's name was Hind, so that name seemed to be quite a popular name at that time. Hind binti Auf, ibn Zuhair ibn Harith, and that goes on. Maymuna radiallahu anha was uh, had had two uh, husbands before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She was first married to a person called Masud ibn Amr ibn Umair al Thaqafi. Masud ibn Umair. Uh, for some reason they separated there was a divorce that took place so they separated then after that she got married to a person called Abu Dirham ibn Abdul Uzza she got married to him afterwards he died in 7 Hijri in the 7 year after the Prophet of migration to Medina Munawwara he died and then after that that's when she was ready to marry the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the, the way this happened is a really interesting story that's usually mentioned. The Prophet ﷺ was on his way to, for Umratul Qadha. You know, they were unable to perform the Umrah the year before uh, because they had to break it, the Quraysh didn't let him in. And there was an agreement that they could come the next year. So this was his uh, makeup Umrah, Umratul Qadha. So some opinions say that he actually married her in a place called Sarif. It looks like she was from close there or that's where her sister... 
Umm al-Fadl bint al-Harith was Abbas radiallahu anhu's wife. So she's the sister-in-law of the Prophet uncle, Abbas radiallahu anhu. So when she heard about the Prophet sallallahu coming for Umrah and learnt more about him and everything, she was a, a, obviously a divorcee and a, a widow in that sense from two husbands before. So she must have mentioned this to her sister. Her, her sister must have mentioned this to Abbas radiallahu anhu. There's various stories about how exactly that happened. And Abbas radiallahu anhu uh, said to the Prophet sallallahu sallam and suggested that she's a good woman. And so... They got married. So it says that they did the nikah on the way to Umrah in a place called Sarif, which is just outside of Makkah Mukarramah, some miles, 10 miles or so after. That's where they got married. And then after that, because remember Abbas had stayed in Makkah Mukarramah, so he was still from that area. And then after that, on the way back, after the person went for Umrah and came back, completed, had completed his Umrah and so on. And then after that, at Sarif, that's when she was brought along, one of, the, one of, uh, one of his uh, servants or slaves uh, brought her. And then that's where they had made a tent and that's where the consummation took place, at Sarif as well. So she got married in Sarif and then a consummation took place there. And then subhanAllah, many, many years later, after the Prophet had passed away, she ended up passing away down there as well. So it's a really uh, interesting that sometimes uh, multiple events a significant events in your life happen in the same place. It says about her that she is uh, the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those women who have gifted themselves to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The verse that I read at the beginning, وَمْرَأَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ إِنْ وَهَبَتْ نَفْسَهَا لِلنَّبِيِّ إِنْ أَرَادَ النَّبِيُّ أَنْ يَسْتَنْكِحَهَا خَالِصَةً لَكَ مِنْ دُونِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ so any woman who gifts themselves to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if Allah's messenger wants to marry them, he can. You know, he can. That's kind of the gist of what we're saying. So she want, She was quite excited when the Prophet sallallahu accepted her in marriage. She said, "I don't want anything. I don't want anything." And so she gifted herself. But the Prophet sallallahu gave her either four hundred dirhams as a mahar or five hundred dirhams as a mahar. And nowadays we're actually now encouraging rather than mahar fatimi, we're actually encouraging. The, the mahar, the dowry of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, because that happened multiple times and that's pretty agreed upon in terms of the figure there while the mahar of uh, Fatima radiallahu anha obviously happened once and according to one opinion it's the same as the mahar azwaj as well but there's multiple opinions about that and uh, we're saying that you should probably do what the Prophet ﷺ did right there's nothing wrong with doing mahar Fatimi but for 20 years or so, Mahar Fatimi has been the kind of trend in many communities and now it, it is shifting to Mahar Azwaj, Mahar of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now she's from a really, really interesting family because she's got connections all over in the sense that her sisters are married to prominent people or from them come really prominent people. And one of the wisdoms they say in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marrying her is that her side of the, her tribe uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in those days, especially nowadays, this doesn't really work much. To be honest, there's sometimes not even any respect for in-laws. But in those days, in-laws were very important. You married your uh, a woman in your family to somebody else, or a man in your family got married to a woman. It's like the two tribes would have to really start respecting one another, and would have to really like look after one another almost. This was alliances in those days, and they were very, very important. Oh, they've got our daughter now. Oh, we've got their daughter. We are connected. We're like brothers and sisters almost. I mean, it's not that close, but it used to get really, really close. So a lot of the times that used to work for stopping kind of enmity, stopping rivalry. There was a benefit in that. There was also benefit in doing that in terms of just if you wanted to dominate, then you strategically got married into or yourself or your children or your brothers or sisters or somebody got strategically married in different tribes. They're all on your side now. So your side now dominates over the other side. I don't know, I don't think much of that remains. There's very few people who actually respect this now and would go all out for their... I mean, it's still there to a certain degree, but in this postmodern world, we're living with individualism and so on, and selfishness pretty much. It, it, people just care for themselves. They don't even care for their own parents anymore. So, I mean, who cares about an in-law anymore? You know. Uh, so, and I'm not saying all the tribes in the world were like that. Some tribes aren't like that. 
you know, weren't like that. But I think in many cases, especially the Arab tribes were definitely like that. The Turkic tribes were like that. And a number of other places, uh, that, that is exactly how it used to be. So there was a certain benefit. Now, uh, she, had, um, she, she had some brothers, uh, she had some sisters uh, that were entirely uh, her full brothers, and, uh, full brothers and sisters, meaning the fa- their father and mother were the, were the same, Harith, and the mother were the same. And um, some of them uh, were uh, just her mothers, uh, just shared in her mothers, uh, in mothers and not in the fathers. So they were her half sisters. So her full her, her full sisters. One was Umm al Fadl, whose name was Lubaba al Kubra. Umm al Fadl, Lubaba al Kubra, bint al Harith, who's the wife of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Anhu. Then she had a Lubaba as Sughra. So that was a tradition of the time as well, that they had the same name and called one the elder and called the other one the younger. So, you know, if you really like the, the, the name Fatima, for example, so you call the older one Fatima al Kubra and the younger one Fatima as Sughra. I mean, it might create a bit of confusion, but they did it. So one was Lubaba al Kubra and the other one was Lubaba as Sughra. Lubaba Sughra's name was, you'd you probably know, As, uh, Asma. Her name was Asma bint al Harith. She's the wife, she was the wife of Walid ibn al Mughira. And from that, you should figure out that that's Khalid ibn al Walid's mother. So she's got one nephew, Abdullah ibn Abbas. She's got another nephew, meaning uh, Maymuna radiallahu has one nephew, is Abdullah ibn Abbas. The other nephew is Khalid ibn al Walid radiallahu anhu. And she had others which you, uh, which, uh, you won't, uh, you know, people don't know, they're not as, as well known. Then she's got other sisters who are just her mother's, uh, uh, j- j- who are just share the, share the mother. And that's Asma binti Umais. She's, she's well known. Asma binti Umais. She's her sister, but half sister only. She was the wife of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. So they've got a son called Abdullah ibn Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And Aoun. That's another one of her sons. So that's two other nephews that she had as well. Now, there's a famous story that once Abdullah ibn Abbas, her nephew, wanted to see how the Prophet spends his night. So it's a famous Sahih narration that he wanted to see how the Prophet and what he does at night and what's his worship and so on. So he asked his aunt Maymuna, radiallahu anh, can I come and spend the night with you guys? Uh, so he did that. And then he explains exactly what happened. The Prophet went to sleep and then after that, he got up and then there was a water skin uh, where they used to store water. So he went open that. He did water wudu from there and then I watched and then so on. And then he started his prayer and I joined in. I was on the wrong side. He pulled me to the other side and gives this whole description. So that was an interesting kind of adventure of his or actually inquiry of his really. I mean, he got the ability to do that because uh, she was his auntie. So she could do that. She... Um, uh, as I said, she was very particular about the Sunnah, and she, uh, you, you could tell from her narration, she's got a number of narrations to her name, a number of hadiths to her name, and a number of them are uh, related by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim as well. So, in Bukhari and Muslim, she has uh, six narrations altogether. Muslim has transmitted five, and Imam Bukhari has transmitted one. And Altogether, there's 13. Uh, th- those are individually what Imam, only Imam Bukhari has. Uh, there's one that only Imam Bukhari has. There's five that only Imam Muslim has. But then in addition, those that they, uh, they add as well in total, that they both uh, transmit in total is about 13 narrations. So she used to obviously vocalize and, and teach others. There's a number of Sahaba who have studied with her. A lot, a lot of them were her nephews. So they managed to get a lot of knowledge from her. Uh, being with the Prophet Sallallahu She was there with the Prophet for the last two and a half, three years because she got married in the seventh year of Hijrah. So she's obviously the last of the wives that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married. On one occasion, one of her servants had gone to Abdullah ibn Abbas Sallallahu's house to maybe give something or bring something. Her name was Badiya. She went to Abdullah ibn Abbas anhu's house and she noticed that the bedding for the couple was separate. So his is on one side and her, his wife's is on the other side. 
So she came back and reported this to she thought maybe they've got some problems, so she reported it to the aunt that maybe you can sort it out or something like that. It wasn't just gossip, right? It was probably a reason for that. So when Maimun radiallahu anha found out, actually that Abdullah ibn Abbas thought that he had to stay away from his wife in menstruation. So it was a misunderstanding. She corrected it. She said the Prophet used to sleep with us. In fact, in a, on another occasion, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas's hair wasn't combed. She says, what, why, why, isn't, why are you in this disheveled state? He says, oh, my wife has not been recombing my hair because um, you know, she's on her menses or something. He said, we used to do that with the Prophet The Prophet in fact, when we were on menses, she, he would actually have his head in our lap. right? And he would be resting there reading the Qur'an. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. So uh, she, she used to correct a lot of wrongs in that regard as well. So that's uh, pretty much what is known about her life because I guess it was just the last three years and there's, uh, the others were for much longer but that's what's known from there and uh, we've learned of uh, the various different benefits that that, that brought Aisha radiallahu anha used to praise her and our praise coming from a co-wife is very very valuable she actually said that إِنَّهَا كَانَتْ أَتْقَانَا لِلَّهِ وَأَوْ صَلَنَا لِلْرَحِمْ which means that she was one of the most God-fearing among us, one of the most God-conscious among us. And she was also one of those who were most particular about tying the knots of kinship, like keeping uh, you know, with the relatives. It's a very, very important thing. As I said, we just spoke about that in the beginning, that that's being lost today. Right? There's people who have not met their aunties for years or their uncles for a long time, subhanAllah. It's really strange. So there you go. Um, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward her abundantly, elevate her status, and that we can learn from the likes of her and the other azwaj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She used to take loans sometimes for fulfilling a certain purpose or whatever. On one occasion, she took a really big loan. So some people were concerned that how are you going to pay it back? It's such a huge loan. What are you going to do? She said that the Prophet ﷺ said that anybody who takes a loan with a firm intention to pay it back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps him. And that's true. If you take loans, genuinely if you need something and you take a loan for that, I mean taking a loan is difficult, it's not easy. Uh, and then some people if they get too used to it, they take a lot of loans and let everybody down, that's a problem as well. And some people are just very, they don't want to take a loan. But sometimes you have to, if there's a need for it, if there's an absolute need, take a loan. But full intention to pay back and Allah makes it easy to pay back. So look at that tawakkul that she has. So there's a number of other uh, narrations like that. I think there was another woman who had made a vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if she gets cured from some illness that she was in, that she's going to go to all the way to Baytul Maqdis, to Jerusalem to do salat down there. And mashallah, she became better. So I think... She came to visit Maimun before she set off. And Maimun anha told her that you don't need to go all the way down there. There's get more reward of praying here in Masjid Nabawi. Pray here. So she would give fatwas as well uh, like that. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further. An inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.